What it really takes is a family, and we as conservatives have to fight for the family. A party that desires to lead this country must have an agenda that the American people believe helps them. What is it that we can do to keep government from growing so large we can win this battle? Welcome everyone to the highlight and the climax of our conference, our panel on Towards a New Consensus, Prospects for a Humane Economy. Now we have returning to the stage a couple of familiar faces, uh, one of whom is Sam Gregg, who's a distinguished fellow in political economy at the American Institute for Economic Research and is the author of the forthcoming book, The Next American Economy. Also here is Philip Blonde, director of Res Publica, author of Red Tory, and professor of Christian philosophy and politics at the University of Public Service in Budapest. Joining us for the first time, a very distinguished guest indeed, is Rick Santorum, who served as United States Senator for Pennsylvania from 1995 to 2007. In 2012, he ran for president with what might be called the right message at the wrong time. He, it was a message of blue collar and pro-family conservatism that was several years ahead of the curve and uh, really, I think, blazed a trail that uh, has been followed by a number of uh, you know, uh, other uh, fig public figures in the years since. And uh, in some ways, uh, the rest of the Republican Party is still catching up to the themes that you uh, spelled out in 2012. Uh, Senator Santorum, among other accomplishments, is the author of the 2005 book, It Takes a Family, Conservatism and the Common Good, which was published by ISI Books, as it happens. So again, uh, tonight's panel is Towards a New Consensus, Prospects for a Humane Economy. I'd like to offer you all the opportunity to open your phones and, uh, you know, for once you have permission to do that, and to look at the ISI app, where you can uh, get started on preparing any questions you may have for our panelists, and also uh, take note of the polls we have in the ISI app, asking you for your impressions on uh, this whole weekend's programming and also on uh, this final uh, event of the uh, two days. So without uh, prolonging my introductory remarks, I'll simply say I am again Daniel McCarthy, Vice President for the Collegiate Network at the Intercollegiate Studies Institute and also the editor of Modern Age, a uh, publication that ISI has been bringing out uh, consistently for a good long time and that was in fact started back in 1957 by Russell Kirk, author of The Conservative Mind. So the first question I have for our three panelists tonight, and we'll start with uh, Sam Gregg, is everything seems to be going wrong right now in the United States economy. We have uh, life expectancy is down, birth rates have slightly inched up over the past year, but in general we've seen a decline in American birth rates, and we are in the midst of the you know, most wild inflation that we've seen since the 1970s. It seems as if we are facing just tremendous adversity for families and for individuals and for firms within the American economy today. What is driving this? Is America in decline? Is this going to be something that we can overcome? Or are the conditions that we're facing today the beginning of a very long and dark night for the United States? Well, thank you for that optimistic, uh, <laughs> optimistic question. <clears throat> Well, I think uh, everything you just described is empirically true. Everything you described uh, about inflation, about uh, our population mm -hmm. issues, which I think are very serious, especially when one comes to think about things like the sustainability of our tax base, let alone all the welfare programs that have been mm -hmm. premised on the basic assumption that people will replicate themselves. Um, <clears throat> when we look at things like uh, our government's inability to stop spending money that it doesn't have. When we think about things like a Federal Reserve and a central, a central bank that is now under pressure to include things like DEI as part of its mandate. When we look at things like our federal debt, when we look at things like the, uh, the growth of the administrative state, which has taken off again with uh, the current administration, uh, it's a pretty bleak picture. 
And some of the classic conditions for what was called stagflation in the 1970s are looming over us very much now. And one thing we know about stagflation, at least from the experience of the 1970s, is that it's a very painful experience to try and escape from. It's very, very difficult. And in the 1970s, <clears throat> it was done by very drastic and very painful means that ended up increasing unemployment, uh, making Ronald Reagan, 19, in 1982, I think his approval rating was 35%. Um, <clears throat> there were all sorts of very bad things happening. But it's also true that the United States turned itself around. And it did so in a relatively quick period of time, starting, interestingly enough, in the latter years of the Carter presidency. So people forget that um, Jimmy Carter was one of the first people to, to embrace some degree of deregulation of the economy. This is before Ronald Reagan, right? So <clears throat> it seems to me that one of the great things about America is it does have this capacity for rejuvenation, for revival, whether it's on a cultural level or whether it's on an economic level. So I tend to be optimistic about this because I think Americans and the American society and the American culture, because it's innovative, because it takes the ideal of liberty seriously, because it does have this tradition of, let's call it market capitalism, because it does have this tradition of making changes, being willing to dispense with problems that have been bequeathed by the past, I'm relatively optimistic about these sorts of things. Um, but that being said, I think it's also the case that there's enough groups in America who do not want to see the status quo changed. I think crony capitalism is a very serious problem in the United States, and one thing we know about cronies is that they really don't want to give up the status quo. So while I'm optimistic, I do think there are some particular barriers that we are going to have to seriously think about and come up with innovative, innovative ways of overcoming. But I also think that going back and looking at the American experience and how we've done this before, not least so that we can avoid some of the mistakes that have happened in the past. I think, for example, of the New Deal, the Great Society, which we're still lumbering under as a consequence of those particular programs because bad decisions and wrong decisions were made at that particular point in time. So while I tend to be optimistic, I think we need to be very realistic about some of the economic challenges, both domestic and international. But I also think there's a, there's a certain degree of reality broke, breaking in now about how we think about these sorts of questions. One thing I've noticed about this particular conference, we've spoken a lot about China. And this is not the type of conversation I'm sure that we, I'm sure we would have been having say six years ago, about some of the complications both on an international level and on a domestic level that China represents for the United States economically and politically. But I've heard many things, good things said at this particular conference about how we tackle that particular problem. I've also heard some things that I profoundly disagree with when it comes to that particular problem. But at least we're having a much more serious conversation about some of these questions than we were having five, six, ten years ago. Philip, uh, what is your diagnosis of the American condition coming as you do from the UK and seeing certain parallels and differences between our situation and the one that is facing Britain? I, I think the primary problem in America is not economic. Uh, I think it's cultural. America is polarizing at an unprecedented rate. And, and the divisions actually replicate the original <laughs> divisions of, of the Civil War. And if you look at the states that decide the elections and where those elections are decided, they're getting narrower and narrower. And in effect, the real fatality that's at play in America is a cultural and political uh, division of which the economic crisis is, is secondary, I think. Because any society that's unified can essentially survive almost anything. And if you look at, across um, at Western societies, overwhelmingly now European societies are starting to track American societies in terms of polarization. A and what we have is polarization along economic and cultural lines. So what 
our system, what liberal democracy has failed to do, particularly over what might one call the liberal renaissance, is secure the lives, livelihoods, hopes, and dreams of the bottom 50% of the population. What we, in fact, in fact, have done to the bottom half of our societies is remove from them any security, any hope, uh, any solidity, any sense that they have a viable future and a viable economic life. And that level of extreme economic pressure that we, we have created in our, in our population, it's evinced by the famous elephant graph that shows that globalization has overwhelmingly benefited the working class in Asia and penalized not just the working class, but the middle class in the developed uh, Western nations. And that level of undermining has also been accompanied by extreme cultural polarization. As I was trying to suggest in my speech, what we are in, I, I, I quite like the idea of elite competition. I think it, it, has, it has some elements of truth. You've got ever more desperate, ever more well-educated children of the bourgeoisie who also want to secure themselves in, in a society that's rapidly feudalizing, that is rapidly pushing security further and further up the economic chain. And they are using culture to persecute those below them and secure their own accession into what might one call the human resources class or the management class. And so in, in a curious way, I think our societies and our economies are refeudalizing. But it's worse than it was in the Middle Ages, because as I think I've said before, in the Middle Ages, um, if you were a serf, you could generate a surplus. Your lord would ask for seven bales of wheat, and provided you gave that to your lord, anything else you produced was yours. And if you actually look at the development of uh, peasant smallholding, they got uh, more and more productive. And indeed, they started to finance the, the creation of an agrarian middle class, aided, of course, by the lack of labor and the fact that labor could start to claim ownership after the Black Death. But for the contemporary world, the ordinary worker cannot improve their lot. The ordinary worker doesn't get uh, surplus, they get debt. And they get more debt the more they try to improve. And for me, the really absent debate in uh, contemporary conservatism is how do we get assets to the assetless? How do we, as I... I remember saying this back in 2010, how do we recapitalize the poor? I believe in popular capitalism, I believe in ownership, I think it is the condition of liberty, which is where we would probably uh, agree. But I don't want liberty just for those who own everything. I want liberty for those who own nothing. And an astonishing proportion of Western populations own very little, almost nothing. And if you look at the claims, as I said, for democracy, the aim of democracy was to secure property and assets and security for those who had none. And I'm afraid the jury's come back in. It's failed. Democracy no longer secures prosperity or security for those who vote for it. And that is the divide. Most of our democracies are now plutocracies. They're controlled by money, wealth, finance, and influence. The laws that get made are essentially the laws that are financed through the lobbying industry. What is remarkable is the utter lack of provision for the mass and for the majorities. Our systems are not unlike the authoritarian cultures that we oppose. You have predation at the top, and subjugation at the bottom. That is the real threat to Western culture. 
That is the real threat to our cultures. That is what open the, opens the doors to popular authoritarianism. And if you look at all the indices, this is why democracy is in retreat, because our form of democracy doesn't work for those at the bottom. I believe in democracy, but I believe in democracy as a democracy of the propertied, of the landed. I want assets and opportunity for all. And we are manifestly incapable of delivering that. It's not too far a stretch to say that we're creating a revolutionary situation, not unlike the revolutionary situations in centuries beforehand. I'm always struck, and I'm increasingly reading the history of Rome, I'm always struck by how the Senate in Rome resisted for 150 years the claims by the tribunes and the plebeians to have a greater share of equity. And we know what happened to that republic. Octavian or Augustus succeeded and actually then instituted a form of equity. So for me, the real economic threat is a cultural one, that the current crisis is being felt very differently. I said it, I think, earlier in my speech. In America, only 9% of those with a college degree think the cost of living crisis is a problem. You living, as Americans, in the most class-divided society in the entire developed world. The class penalty in your country is higher than any other developed nation. If you're on the wrong side of the tracks in America, you die earlier, you live longer in ill health. Fate in America is dictated by your place of birth. If you want social mobility, move to France or move to England, and it's pretty poor there. So for me, all that this crisis is, is an intensification of a crisis that nobody speaks about. Now we as conservatives should believe in something different. We should believe in popular capitalism, but when we say the phrase popular capitalism, we produce plutocracy and ownership of the few. It is time in America and it is time in Britain and it is time across the developed Western world, that we develop ways to deliver ownership to people who have no way of owning as the system currently functions. And unless we do, unless we secure lives at the bottom, there won't be life at the top. Thank you. So this segues, I think, very nicely to some of the themes that Senator Santorum uh, has laid out throughout his career, but especially in his 2012 run uh, for the White House. Uh, Senator Santorum, as you look at America today, how would you apply your analysis? What would you recommend uh, as to our prospects, as to what the conservative movement and Republicans should be doing now to provide for a, a working class that increasingly wants to vote conservative, increasingly is looking away from the Democrats, and yet may or may not be finding the kind of answers and the kind of support uh, that it would like to find uh, on the right? Um, a lot of the rhetoric that I just heard uh, from my friend uh, Phil, which, Philip, which is rhetoric that is uh, quite familiar to me from, uh, from my race in 2012. Uh, uh, I ran a race uh, talking about uh, the importance of workers, uh, the importance of uh, connecting with people. And, and look, I'm uh, not because I'm a great intellectual that I came up with this, but it was just a recognition after having spent 20 years in politics and spent a lot of time, unlike, unfortunately, most politicians, actually going out, meeting, and talking to people, uh, that the, uh, the country had changed dramatically and that uh, the Republican Party had changed and the, conserv and the people who are, who are willing to support conservatives have changed. And, and that if we were gonna be successful electorally, we needed to connect to the people that were actually open to, uh, to voting for us on, on issues, as was said, just said, that are really the issues that divide the country, and that's the culture. Those are the issues, we're seeing it now. I mean, I, I brought this book up 
this is It Takes a Family. I wrote this book uh, 20 years ago with ISI. And I wrote it in response to Hillary Clinton's book, It Takes a Village. And people used to say, well, you know, that's, uh, you know, takes a village, that's this African phrase, you know, that, that was popularized, it takes a village to raise a child. But I understood what they really meant. Now you understand what they really mean. You understand now what they meant by it takes a village, which is you conservatives have the children and we'll take them and we'll indoctrinate them into what we believe. That's the village. And I wrote about that 20 years ago. I wrote about that what it really takes is a family and we as conservatives have to fight for the family. Because if the family doesn't have control over our children, then we are lost. And if we don't build and, and rebuild the family, rebuild marriage, everything you say is true except one missing piece. If you're married, none of those problems exist. You say, you know, poor people, people who are poor, I mean, we, the workers don't have a chance. Not true if they're married. If they're married, they actually do fine. There actually is upward mobility. Why? Because, well, you know, divide and conquer, right? Any of you have any kids? It's a lot easier with one, two parents than it is with one. It's like in life. The idea that, and this is what I tried to stress in, in this early work, which is conservative policy should be social policy to protect our children from the onslaught of the left. I talk in this book about the bigs and the littles that everything in this country is controlled, every institution in this country. Uh, 20 years ago, I said, every institution in this country is controlled by the left. They, they, they weren't as demonstrative as how they, how they imposed their will on us, but they all controlled. I said, the only thing left is the family and the church, and they are going to destroy both in the, in the coming years. And they did. This is when I was advocating for a Defense of Marriage Act, and I was advocating for a constitutional amendment to define marriage. All of these things that, that people said, oh, you'll never have to worry about any of that. This is just alarmism on the part of the right. The reality is that all along, it was about destroying the last vestiges of self-sufficiency and subsidiarity, the opportunity to actually solve problems where they're most solvable, which is within the family. It's to destroy that to create reliance on the state, the bigs. And so if we don't recognize prima facie, that the family is where we have to start, that all of these other things are important, economy is important, all these other, if we don't restore marriage and, and the proper understanding of marriage and its incredible role in providing our workers for the future and having children and supporting that family. I, I love reading the Wall Street Journal. It's one of the few papers I read, but it drives me crazy that anytime we do anything in the federal government to support the family, it is an apostasy. It's not conservative. Well, we can go out and support all these other businesses by preferential tax rates and deregulation, but if we support the most essential business in America. What's the most essential business in America? The family. Every family is a small business. But we don't look at it that way. We don't, every family is an economic unit. Why don't we just consider that if we, even, even our, take our libertarian friends, just consider the family an economic unit and maybe they'll treat us better. Maybe they'll actually do things to encourage family formation, support of children to be raised. So to me, that's the, that's the foundational part at which I wrote about. But what, fast forward to 2012, and I recognize that this group of people that we used to rely on to support the Republican Party, which were suburban voters, was gone. And they were gone, not because they were not doing economically well, they're doing very well economically. But like all people who do well economically, as the Bible says, is is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of an evil, and it is through a rich man to enter heaven. They have become not people of the Bible, but people of the God of self. And people of the God of self focus on what pleases me and not what's right or wrong. 
What's happened in suburban America is that they have, they have gone woke. They have bought in to the culture of materialism and self. And they aren't going to vote for us because we, they don't want to be told that what they want to do to make themselves happy, even though it's immoral and wrong, is they don't want to be told by a group of politicians that they're wrong. They don't want to be shamed. And so we started to lose them. But the people who suffer the consequences of a woke culture, of a culture that doesn't elevate marriage, that, that, that promotes in many ways single life, single parenthood, they really, the people, those people realize the devastation that it's bringing them. And they, they want a healthier culture. Poor people want to get married. They just can't. There just isn't anybody to marry. And, and yet they, they desperately understand how important that is. And we need to provide a vision and a voice for that. So that's what I did when I ran for, for president in 2012. I talked about the, um, I forget what it's called now, but uh, I, uh, which is, you know, the three things you have to do and you'll never be in poverty. I talked about this. The one thing Mitt Romney picked up from my campaign was this, this idea, which is that if you, uh, if you graduate from high school, you have a full-time job, and you, don't get, and you don't have children before you get married, the chance of you ever being in poverty is less than 2%. That, seems so common sense. And everything we talked about in 2012 was common sense about bringing manufacturing back here, controlling immigration. Why? Because immigration, in my opinion, bringing people, illegal immig immigrants into this country just creates more disadvantage for low-income workers in America. That resonated with people. And so I wrote this book after the race called Blue Collar Conservatism, Final Story. So I was on a radio station in, uh, in New York promoting my book, Blue Collar Conservatism, and talking about how we had to run and, and focus on working men and women if we were ever going to have a chance of winning Pennsylvania and Michigan and uh, you know, Wisconsin, et cetera. And I got a call from a friend of mine and said, what did you say about Donald Trump on the radio this morning? I said, I didn't say anything about Donald Trump on the radio. He said, yeah, you did, because he called me and said he wants to talk to you. And I said... Okay, give him my number. I'm happy to talk to him. He didn't talk to me. He sent me a text. It was a, it was a transcript of the radio program, of which I did not mention his name, didn't even reference him, but I talked about uh, Joe Piscopo was beating up on Atlantic City and, uh, and closing casinos, which he did, and I just said, well, you can't blame the people who closed the casinos, and went on and described why, and he circled that, said, thank you, because, of course, everything is about Donald Trump. He said, thank you. It said, come see me in New York. So I went two, two, uh, two months later, month, month and a half later, to New York, walk into his office. He's sitting behind his desk, and he's holding a copy of not this book, but my book, Blue Collar Conservatism. And I walked in, and he, before I said a word, he said, I read your book! <laughs> <laughs> and I said, uh, I said, yeah, you didn't read my book. No! I read your book. Great book. <laughs> and, and I said, yeah, the hell you read my book. No, I read this book. And then he went on and told me about what was in the book. And then he made the claim that someone needs to run for president on this book. And he did. And he did a much better job than I did. And uh, this is the future of the Republican Party. It's the future of the conservative movement. We are a blue-collar party. We are a party of people who aspire to marry, aspire to have good and stable lives, and we don't talk to them about it. In fact, we actually vote for gay marriage. We don't even vote for marriage anymore because we're afraid of the popular culture and the bigs who we're afraid will crush us if we stand up against them. These opening remarks give us a very powerful sense of the hopes and the hardships of the United States today. I thought for the second round we might uh, go to specific policy ideas that can improve the lot of Americans today. And I'll start with Sam Gregg. We've had a, you know, uh, references to family policy several times from other speakers, both on this panel and in previous panels. Um, you're a classical liberal. What would be the classical liberal pitch to family voters, and what uh, solutions would you propose 
for the difficulties, the challenges that are facing American families today? Well, the senator made a comment about the three criteria that are needed for success in America that, don't, that will pretty much stop you from falling into poverty. Uh, the person who came up with those three things, which are finish high school, get married, and get a job. The job was the third one. Have, get married before you have children. Right. The person who came up with this was Michael Novak, the author of The Spirit of Democratic Capitalism. And he wrote a lot about different policy questions. He was like me, very much a free marketer, etc. But one of the things he was very firm about was that if you're going to have a free society in which virtue is taken seriously, in which ideas about the common good, properly understood, are taken seriously, you need three things. He said basically you need a dynamic commercial sector. That's how you produce wealth. Mercantilism doesn't produce wealth. It produces dependence, cronyism, privileges, favors, cities like Washington, D.C. But he also said beyond that, you need a certain role for government, a very clearly defined role for government, and he had very much in mind the American experiment in constitutional liberty. But he also said the third thing you need is a particular type of culture. You just can't have any type of culture in which politics and markets function as they're supposed to. So if you live in a culture which is hedonistic, if you live in a culture in which self-interest is understood as selfishness, if you live in a culture in which you refuse to define things by the reality of what they are. I mean, I was thinking this the other day when we were talking about um, redefining a, a, a recession, right? I was thinking, okay, we, we can't even define what a woman is now, right? So this, this nominalist name calling and game playing that goes on and on and on. If you live in that type of culture, you should expect that politics and the market are going to deliver certain outcomes that in the long term are detrimental to markets, detrimental to constitutional order, and detrimental to culture. And as I said on my opening remarks, I think, yesterday, the best free market thinkers have always understood this. They've always understood that a free society a society that's characterized by a certain idea of freedom, a society that takes virtue very ser seriously. These free market thinkers have always understood that you need certain things in place if you're going to have a market economy that produces mobility, upward mobility, that creates wealth, that enables us to consume the things that we, we need, the things that we desire, the things that often make life beautiful. We need these sorts of things in place, and if you don't have that, you end up with some very, very bad results. A very good book which I would recommend uh, that has published by ISI actually on several occasions is a book that I often return to is uh, Wilhelm Robke's A Humane Economy. So this was written in 1958 and the German title translates as Beyond Supply and Demand. Now this book is very important because Wilhelm Robke was a firm anti-Nazi, a firm anti-communist, he was forced out of Germany in 1933 uh, by the Nazis because he was very much against them. He was against their program. He wasn't Jewish. He was a war hero. He fit the perfect Aryan criteria that the Nazis wanted. He said, no, I'm not going to go along with this. And he wrote about some of these questions about, well, how do we have a type of free economy that has a type of culture and political setting that is going to enable us to resist the type of totalitarians that emerged in the 20th century. And his book, A Humane Economy, has a lot about economics in there. He's very good, I think he's a very good free market thinker. He has a lot to say about free trade. He has a lot to say about sound money. He has a lot to say about the workings of the domestic economy. All of much pretty much fit a standard free market line. But most of the book is actually about the type of cultural settings that you need. And he said, for example, you need stable families. You need things like a common understanding of what morality is. You need a common understanding of what human nature is. Because if you don't have a common understanding of these things, then all the policy solutions that you try are going to be occurring against a background that's not actually going to allow these policy solutions to occur. So, I mean, it's very, I think much of the discussion in America right now about economic policy is highly technical. I mean, I've argued with people here about things like industrial policy, I'm against it. 
I've argued with people here against protectionism, very much against that. But what strikes me is what's missing from some of this discussion is some of these deeper, harder to grapple with questions that technocrats can't solve and which are very much lying in the realm of culture. And culture happens to be, and I think the Senator's right here, the culture in America right now is really seriously messed up. So unless free marketers, I think, free marketers like myself, are willing to think more about these questions and to think more about how do you have a dynamic economy, a dynamic market economy, which produces stresses, which produces a lot of turmoil, which produces the, 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 the creative destruction, which produces wonderful things, but also destroys things in the process. Unless you have a particular type of culture in place, these things can end up being very dysfunctional. And politics can't fix those problems. Families can fix those problems. Some cultural institutions used to be able to deal with that and in less of a position to do that now. Law can do some things at the margins, but really only at the margins. So I think unless free marketers and anyone who's really concerned about the future of the American economy is willing to think about some of these broader questions, then we'll end up talking and arguing about technical issues that are important and matter but nonetheless need to be embedded in a type of culture that allows a society to flourish as it should. Our audience has received a powerful impression of Philip Blond's strengths as a philosopher and as a historian, uh, but you're also a policy thinker, and you've run a policy think tank in the UK, Res Publica, since uh, 2009, I believe. What are some particular policy ideas that you've worked on over the years, either that you would think apply very well to the United States or that have worked uh, sufficiently well in the UK that you would recommend them as things that might be emulated uh, by Americans? So, um, thank you, Daniel. And I also think you're in complete agreement. Culture is first, and I agree profoundly with the senator's remark about, about family. So, I do a lot of... Um, I, I'm sort of a sort of quasi-emergency service for conservatives. When they're about to lose elections, they give me a call uh, and they say, come and save Christian democracy. And of course, who could say no to, to that? So, so um, I go over and, and I've done this in several countries and, and I've consistently tried to do it in Britain. And the politicians normally themselves are incapable of of thinking anew, primarily because they're addicted to the means they follow. And the means they follow no longer work, it no longer delivers the outcomes they want. And what you have to do is return to first principles and say, the family is in trouble. It's no longer surviving. We're penalizing the creation of children. We're, we're penalizing looking after those children. What do we do? And you start anew. So on family policy, I've, I've long argued that we need to, if you look at family formation, there's a typical point of constriction when you have young children in the first few years and overwhelmingly women want to stay at home longer than they're permitted or allowed to do if, if they're not wealthy. And there's a point of extreme constriction economically and socially where there's a lot of family breakup. In Britain, I've argued for the transferability of tax allowances. So the tax-free proportion of your income, I think spouses should be able to transfer to one another to enable families to essentially uh, have some additional leeway. In Britain, um, we tax individually, uh, people individually, but we give benefits uh, on a household basis. The result of this in part, is that we tax single earning households more heavily than anyone else in the OECD. So if, if the woman wants to stay at home and the uh, husband goes out to work, they pay a far greater proportion of tax than any other family formation you can imagine. So what I think we have to do is take a leaf out of the policy uh, ideas in Poland and in Hungary where they convert having a family and they ally that with asset accumulation. Just think about that. What they say, in effect, is if you have uh, a family, 
you'll get subsidised mortgage uh, loans so that you can own a house. If you have family over a certain number, the woman is freed from any income tax. If you have family over a certain number again, I think it's four, you never pay any future income tax. They've allied family policy and asset policy. So essentially, through having a family, you get security. You are, you are able to own your own home and earn more and provide for your family. And I think that instead of family being the site of maximal insecurity, which is what it is in our countries, it should be the point of maximal security so that you get through uh, those periods. I'm also struck by how difficult it is to obtain assets and how once you have assets, you don't really experience poverty ever again. And it seems to me a crucial element of any redemptive policy has to be how to allow those who don't have assets to acquire them. For instance, one of the most successful saving schemes for the poor ever is a matching savings scheme, where, you, where if you say to families, we will match whatever pound or whatever dollar you save, the saving rates for the poor rocket, which means that when um, your child reaches maturity, they potentially have asset to a fund that can support them through education, support them in, or support them at the launch of business. I certainly think if you look at inheritance tax and you look at the enormous amount of wealth that has fallen in my country, in London, in the Southeast, where your wealth has gone up by tens of thousands of percent, that one can hypothecate inheritance tax at a certain level from wealthy estates to help fund a matching scheme. I also think that it's remarkable that we tax income more than we tax capital, more than we tax wealth, and that we often have benefits for those who accumulate wealth so that they have tax-free um, uh, portions of their income on which tax is not charged. In England, this is called capital gains tax, and you have £12,000 a year which you aren't taxed upon. The vast majority of people never claim £12,000 because they don't ever have an estate or a capital gain which they can offset against that. I think that people should be allowed to sell the putative uh, um, tax allowance to those who need it, so that they can capitalise the tax allowances they never otherwise would use. And I think they should be allowed to sell that gain for 10 years. And the person who buys that gain wouldn't obviously get the same amount of reduction and the state can take a certain proportion. But that could be used to endow those families with security. I also think that we should look at ways in which those who rent for life and have no prospect of ownership, which by the way now includes the children of the middle classes, can, can also use similar tax allowances to buy the house they rent off their private landlords. And so also enter the property ownership class. And I think it's imperative that we look at how the disproportion in uh, wealth taxes against income taxes can be reversed. And if we believe work is the way out of poverty, then we should make it so. Senator Santorum, you have long experience in lawmaking. What policy or set of policies would you like to see the Republican Party adopt today that you think would be most effective in conveying the impression that the party is supportive of families and of working Americans? Well, a lot of the ideas that Philip just went through, uh, I was in Hungary and spoke at uh, CPAC Hungary and, and had an opportunity to learn a lot about, and one of the reasons I went there was to learn more about their family policy and uh, what Philip described is exactly right. And you can argue about how the, this is structured, but the important thing is, and this is, I'm, I'm talking about this as, yes, someone who you know, gets deeply involved in policy, but more importantly, someone who wants to win elections, 
because you can have all the great policy in the world, but if you're not winning elections and you're not convincing people to join you in what you believe, uh, you're not going to be very successful. But just having a set of policies that elevate marriage and the family and having it as a major plank of a, of a political party uh, it would be revolutionary. I tried to do that. I tried to do it for 15 years when I was in the, in the House and Senate and I tried to run a, a campaign on it. And um, I, it worked. If you look, I, I, we always did analysis of how I was doing in Republican primaries versus Romney. And uh, I mean, you, Romney won, won higher and middle income people and I won lower, lower uh, and, and lower middle income people. I mean, it was, it was just clear. Uh, the, every 30, I ran in 30 states against them and it, the numbers were just, you know, and the bottom line is in this country, there are more folks who voted for me than there are folks who voted for him. And, and that's what the Democrats are really worried about right now, is that the way this is breaking apart is a huge opportunity for Republicans. If we had a leader in our party who didn't go out and intentionally turn people of color off for, because of some of the things that they say, uh, we, we would actually, I think we could have done 20 points better in the last election among Hispanics. Not among blacks, that's a longer, that's a longer, uh, a longer uh, journey. But there's no question that the policies that, the economic policies that, that we have been advocating are very much benefiting lower and middle income people, but it's the fact that they, they aren't benefiting them enough because the family policy is bad, because families aren't forming. And so if we went out there and, and, and delivered that message, one of the things I've been advocating for for a couple of years now and actually have uh, uh, been up and testified in Congress and done it is paid family leave. Now, let me just, I voted against unpaid family leave when I was in Congress because I didn't, I didn't approve of mandates on, on businesses. And I'm not sure I'd vote for it today. But I would vote for paid family leave using, as Philip said, using benefits that are already coming to you, whether they're Social Security benefits 50 years from now or whether they're child tax credits that you're going to get for that child over the next 18 years and moving them forward so, so mom or dad or both can stay home during this critical time of, uh, of when, when children who are born have to bond with their parents. There's just all, we, we are losing children... <laughs> Every hour of every day whose parents are not home and they're being warehoused somewhere in daycare and are going to be faced with all sorts of problems, mental and physical problems, because they never had a bonding experience with their parents. Mm -hmm. this, that's just true. And yet we as Republicans who know we can help save these babies that we fight to have born and are unwilling to do anything. Unwilling to do anything because, well, you know, we don't want to get into that. It is insane. The left is right when they say, oh, yeah, all you do is care about them being born. You don't care about doing anything for them after they're born. Now, what they want to do actually harms children after they're born because they want to put them in, they want to put them in government everything. But what we can do is we have to propose something that works. And there are things that work, that employ, d deploy the family and support the family. And if we make it a, a, a priority for, for us as conservatives, that we are, we are gonna, not just going to have policies that support the family, but we are going we are, we are to be the party of families. And I don't mean any family. I mean a man and a woman who can have and raise children for the future of a country. That is a unique and special relationship. That, Will we, will we be condemned? I mean, you know, look at, look at Viktor Orban. I mean, Viktor Orban was getting, you know, called a racist and everything else here in this country because of a speech he gave. It's not because of the speech he gave. It's because he stands up to the left. We all know this. We have, if there's one thing that I am eternally grateful to Donald Trump, he showed that you don't have to fear these people, that you can stand up to them. Yes, it is hard. It's always hard. But let me assure you, it's harder not to stand up to them in the long run. Jeff Sessions know that. It is so much better. It is so much better to never say I'm sorry to these, these complete fraud hypocrites that are the national media. And we just need to have the courage to go out there and deliver the truth. Final point, virtue. 
We are lost in America. I mean, John Adams said that this country, this constitution was made for a moral religious people, wholly inadequate for the governance of any. Why? Because if we don't have a virtuous people, republics, democracies fail. Absolutely. And so we just need to stop playing along with the popular culture. Stop accepting these things that deconstruct civilization. And I know you'll offend some of your friends. And I know when, when you're in school that you will be, you know, a unicorn. Not, a, not using them, they, or Xi Jim. Okay? But you need to be virtuous and stand for the truth. And you need to be willing to pay for the price for that. And you will. And you need to thank God that you're paying that price. You need to thank God that you're suffering for the truth. There's nothing better to suffer for. So we have about uh, 10 minutes left, and I'll call uh, ISI staff to the microphones so that uh, we can take a couple of questions from the app. And I'd also like audience members to go to the microphones and uh, have your questions for our panelists ready. Uh, Sam Gregg has a few remarks I think yeah, you'd like to make. The only thing I would like to add is <clears throat> we've talked a little bit about some positive things that could be done vis-a-vis -vis family. I think it's also worth considering the many government programs that have done immense damage to families in the United States going back to the New Deal. Uh, think, for example, of the African-American community before the Great Society. It was a society, a group of people who were rising out of poverty re relatively quickly, despite all the terrible segregation, despite all the discrimination. You had a vibrant, growing African-American working class. Along comes the New Deal. And what happens to the African-American family? Disintegration starts to happen very, very quickly. In fact, it was a Democrat, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who wrote a book in 1967 pointing out, uh, much to the horror of the progressives of the time, saying these welfare programs are doing immense damage to black families. They're helping to destroy marriages. They're creating dependency. We're starting to see the emergence of people who have not had a job for a generation, et cetera, et cetera. And the fact that uh, our federal government most of its set expenditures are on welfare programs, and there's a great reluctance to admit just how much damage they have done to families. So it's one thing to talk about positive things that you could do. I think you need to think about some of the, the negative <coughs> externalities. I think you need to think about some of the unintended consequences, et cetera. That's fine. But if we don't also think about some of the ways in which big government has done a lot of damage, really since the 1960s, two families and stable families and the type of family arrangements that the senator is talking about, then we're not addressing some of the core driving and, and problems. And if I can in interject here, because we did that, and it was politically popular. It was something that was probably the only conservative success in reform and entitlement was the welfare reform of 1996, which I was the floor manager of back when I was in the United States Senate. And it had a dramatic impact on black poverty and a whole host of other things, and we allowed it because, let me just be very clear, conservatives and Republicans, I'm, I hate to offend, we don't care about the poor. We don't. I, I, I tell you, I lived it. I, the, I was a freshman senator, and I managed the welfare reform, the biggest piece of legislation of that session. I managed it. Why? Because no one else wanted to. No one else cared. They were worried about tax policy, capital gains. No one cared. Now, our movement is changing, but the folks in Washington, they're not part of that movement yet. So we need, we need to do that, but we need, to, we need to educate and form a group of young conservatives who understand this reality. And on that point, let's go to our first question from a young conservative. Uh, hi, this question is from the app, from the ISI app, and it is directed to Senator Santorum, though I think you could all comment on this probably. Um, the question is, should forming a moral populace be the number one priority of the government? Uh, what was that? Uh, should forming a moral populace be the number one priority of a government? A moral populace? That's right. Moral populace. Uh, 
Yeah, I mean, yes, but I don't think I would call it that. <laughs> I, look, everything that's political, has you have to see, the, the, the people that you're pitching it to have to see themselves and, and how it benefits them. How is it gonna make my life better? So I, I don't think I would frame it in that, in, in, but I would, I would talk about family, I, mean, I, I would talk about it in terms of how we're going to create a better society uh, and, and, and what it means to them and how it's gonna improve their lives. So in the interest of getting through as many questions as possible, um, I will promise that both Philip and um, uh, Sam will have opportunities to address whatever questions they may want to uh, as we go along. But um, for the time being, let's go to the next question, and then when the opportunity comes, I'll let you know, Philip and Sam uh, catch up on any other questions they'd like to address. So I can't quite see because of the lights, but we have a question over here. Thank you very much. I am a molecular biologist, immunologist, was a faculty of medicine from University of Pennsylvania. So thank you, Senator Santorum. My question is that we have forgotten the common sense of how to serve the public. And to be very frank, I am a registered Democrat. I voted for Obama with a few dollars here and there. And when they called me for the second run, I said, I need a refund. <laughs> And I am a Democrat, registered Democrat. The reason I'm here is that public health is not a Democrat or Republican issue. There is so much corruption at the highest level of the government and I have some insight because I retired from the National Institute of Health, and I want to see what you can do to help me to, to reduce some of these uh, reductionist approaches to cancer and vaccine so-called vaccine uh, uh, sciences that it's reducing the public immune system. Thank you. So that's an important statement. Um, it is perhaps calling on a level of expertise in science and other things that may be beyond the uh, you know, sort of uh, specialties of our panelists. So with that in mind, uh, while you can certainly keep those remarks in, in your heads, um, let me ask uh, someone on this side to also ask a question, and then I'll let uh, you know whatever responses you feel appropriate uh, be made. So go ahead. Um, so I'm curious, and I kind of know for a fact just from talking to people my age that a lot of people feel like this, um, especially me, I can definitely be susceptible to this, but there's a lot of cynicism um, with the younger generation, and that includes both Democrats and conservatives. Um, regardless of religious beliefs, regardless, there is a lot of cynicism towards um, institutions, towards even values that we hold, um, whereas people thinking just it doesn't work anymore, the system, and I think cynicism tends to breed um, revolution just because people get sick of it, and I think it's a dangerous thing both for an individual and for the society. So how, how can we combat cynicism and what would be some advice you would have towards people who are our age who do sometimes feel like things just aren't working? Okay, Sam, what are your thoughts on how to combat cynicism and uh, any other remarks you'd like to make about the question so far? <clears throat> well, I'm not an optimist, I'm a person of hope. <laughs> and optimism and hope are two different things. It's completely understandable why young Americans or young people in different countries in the developed world are deeply cynical because we have, in many countries, an entrenched political class that tends to cross parties, that um, often has more in common with, with each other than the people they ostensibly represent. 
Uh, I've mentioned the problem of cronyism. I'm not surprised when people, they think of cronyism and they think, well, that's capitalism, that's markets, and I don't want anything to do with that. So I understand why people are very cynical about those sorts of things. It's also very understandable why we, when we look at some of the institutions that uh, once used to play a major role in forming people in the virtues, in the type of culture of the West, which I think is so valuable, which now, uh, at least in the case of uh, Senator Sam Torin and myself, we look at our church and it's a disaster, right? It's a disaster. It has no moral authority whatsoever for understandable reasons. So I completely understand why uh, there is this degree of cynicism that pervades among young people. The good news, I think, is that we can look back in American history and we can see how America has changed itself in very positive ways by looking back to the founding, I think that's a very important reference point for understanding America's capacity to rejuvenate itself, to acquire and reacquire and redevelop an understanding of who we are as a people. America is very different from most countries in that regard because we have formed, our identity lies not in race, not in ethnicity, not in terms of hereditary privilege or anything like that. Our identity comes from ideas. And I think it would be wonderful, and I'm very much supportive of those conservative and classical liberal groups who spend a lot of time, invest a lot of time, in explaining the founding to people, explaining the ideas, why they mattered, and why these, these ideas are truly universal in their application and their meaning. It's very hard. And I speak as someone who's a migrant to the United States, a high-skilled migrant, by the way. Um, what's interesting about this is that I think often migrants often have a better appreciation of these sorts of things because they come from countries where these ideas are not as present, where things are much more related to things that Americans, I think, very find, for, rightly find very difficult to understand when it comes to understanding who people are as a people and their aspirations as a people as well. So that's, that's what I would do. I think that's a very a good way of at least reading yourself into a tradition that I think we can very much give us hope for thinking through some of these problems. So our question from the left side of the audience brought up the issue of cynicism. And from the right side of the audience, we'd heard about uh, corruption in government and the loss of trust in our institutions. It seems quite characteristic of you know, early 21st century politics. Philip, um, what do you see as being you know, sort of the best hope for repairing a sense of trust without which self-government might not be possible at all? I think it's fundamentally important to become romantic again. I think that human beings are deeply idealistic. In politics, um, they, they rather like, if, if I can use as a visual metaphor, they rather like sort of abstract expressionist painting of the 1950s. They like big ideas in color across a vast canvas. And the only way, I think, to counter the the division and the sectarianism and the cynicism is to rediscover at base a deeply romantic and visionary project. One that could potentially appeal across partisan lines. And we've had this before. We, we had it in England. Um, Hogarth's etchings of Gin Alley, uh, a, a period in the late 18th century when everything was falling apart. But you had a massive social revival, the Great Awakening. You had uh, British Christians essentially take over the British Empire and turn the empire from a mercantilist, exploitative entity into essentially a global force for human good that eradicated slavery and, and much else Besides, and I think that, that what, what's lacking on the right is, is a non-defensive, non-reactive, expansionary, emotional, romantic appeal to a new founding, to a new idealism. Why should it just be the promise of Obama well, that was empty and didn't deliver on any level or scale? Something that is founded in the hopes and aspirations of the ordinary would be transformative. 
Something that delivered for the ordinary would command majority support for possibly generations. And I think what the senator said about Republicans not caring about the poor is reflected in my own experience in the British Conservative Party until recently. And until we can care for those for whom we should and come up with programs not that induce dependence but induce independence and security and do so with the broad visionary idealism that the young desperately need and want, we won't get past this. But we've done it, we had it before, we've done it before as Conservatives. Disraeli in the 19th century produced with the Second Reform Act something far more radical than the Liberals had ever produced. This is not beyond our ken and not beyond our capability. It's why for me, I'm a political Catholic really, I think that the future of, of a conservatism that can appeal to the many lies in restoring the hope and promise of a political Catholicism that speaks to all parts of society and promises a whole within which all can enjoy security and futurity. And that is what we need. We need big, expansive, non-technical, non-marginal thinkers that can re-narrate, yes, the founding, but also the future. So I'm going to slightly adjust the question as I direct it towards Rick Santorum, because Senator Santorum, you've been uh, you know, vilified to a greater extent than almost any other elected official in this country over the years. How is it that you've personally been able to resist cynicism or resist uh, you know, a sense of discouragement uh, looking at so much adversity and hostility uh, that has been directed towards you? Well, thank you for that. <laughs> uh, but I think Donald Trump has far outpaced me in vilification, uh, so I, I, I don't hold a candle to what he ha he's had to go through. Um, you know, when I was in public life, I, uh, uh, I always said that I had a constituency of one, and I, I just did what I thought God was calling me to do. And I never really worried whether I won or lost. I, I tried, obviously, worked very hard to win, but I was, I was ultimately accountable to, to God. And as long as I was able to look myself in the mirror and, and sit down with you know, those who are friends, um, spiritual leaders who I, would hold me accountable, as long as I was acting consistent with what I thought was in the best interest of the country and was consistent with, more, with, with those moral principles, I really didn't care what anybody else said about me. I mean, I, I, as I said toward my last comment, you know, consider it gain <laughs> to be vilified. I, when I, I tell this story, it's a true story. When I was running in Iowa, Iowa's a very evangelical place. Pennsylvania is not. Pennsylvania is fairly heavily Catholic, very traditional religions people, lots of structure, you know, we had, you know, Presbyterians and Episcopalians, not very many evangelicals. Went out to Iowa, all these evangelicals out there. In, in, in the Republican primary, they dominate. And so when I was running in 2012, I, you know, I, I'd get up and I'd give the talk, and one of the first questions is, what's your life verse? <laughs> I, 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 you know, well, you know, what's your life verse in the Bible? And I, you know, all of them? I mean, I, you know, I, I didn't know what to say. I never thought, I've never heard a question like that. And so, you know, I, it happened a few times, and I thought, well, I, I need to get a life verse. <laughs> And then as soon as that came out of my mouth, I almost hit myself. I said, you are not getting a life first to win votes, okay? You're not going to do that. So I vowed I would never have a life first because it, I would always suspect that I did it for the wrong reason. And then a couple of years ago, I was uh, reading the Bible and, and came across this verse, and I said, that's it. This is my verse. And the verse is, if they hate you, Remember, they hated me first. If you look throughout the Bible that God just promises suffering, he doesn't promise happiness, he doesn't pick up your cross and follow me. 
this is, this is the way. And, and, and so to be rejected by the culture, I'm in good company. So we are just about at time. I think I see two questions on each side of the room. What I'm going to do is to take uh, the two questions on each side together and uh, ask the questions to be brief and then the responses to be brief as well. So we'll start with the two questions on this side. How can I better convince modern Americans and especially young people that marriage is between one man and one woman and should be recognized as such in law? Do you believe the current political discussion is a restoration of America of the 1920s when there were high tariffs and high immigration controls instituted by the Republican Party? Great, so I'll let each of our panelists choose either one or if they want to briefly respond to both of those questions, go ahead, we'll start with Sam. Well, I'll deal with the immigration one. <clears throat> I think immigration is very good for America. America is a country of migrants. Migrants, for example, and to give you some very practical examples, migrants start more businesses than native-born Americans. It's something like 25% more. The people who come here, who come here who are looking for opportunity, they're fleeing disastrous situations south of the border. They're fleeing countries like Venezuela. They're leaving corrupt, secularist, nationalist dictatorships in the Middle East. They're coming for opportunity, they're coming for freedom. Very few of them are actually coming for things like welfare handouts. Very few of them are coming for things like that. What they're coming for is for opportunity in a country where they wouldn't have it in their own circumstances. So what does this mean? I think that immigration is generally good. I think it should be encouraged. I don't see it as a burden on the country, but there's one thing that needs to be said. Um, we have a disastrous immigration system right now, right? In the sense that it's very easy to migrate here illegally and very hard to do it legally. I know, I went through the whole process of doing it legally. It's expensive, difficult, frustrating, etc. We have exactly the opposite situation of what it should be. The second thing that needs to be said is that when you come to the United States, you shouldn't be looking for a handout, you should be looking for opportunity. And it worries me that when you have a lot of political leaders who are basically trying to use the welfare system as a way of basically buying in people for what they think will be at least three generations of people voting for them. So my view is that economically it's good for the country, provided these sorts of conditions are in place, and that we should celebrate it and not treat it as this thing that we don't really like to talk about or which we see as a drain on the country. So Philip, you can either respond to uh, that question and that set of thoughts from Sam, or if you'd like, talk about the other question and how you make the case for marriage as an institution of one man and one woman to a generation which has been taught otherwise. Yeah, I mean, my, my position on gay marriage is that of Peter Tatchell, who's uh, a gay activist in the 1970s. And what he said in the 1970s was that, um, Gay marriage is homophobic because it essentially tries to classify gay relationships by heterosexual relationships. And I said this, and I wrote a paper with Roger Scruton uh, say, saying this, and, and really I think that what we have to do in a society is defend difference. And what, we, what liberals do is they homogenize everything. So they destroy difference. And so if you look at liberalism now, it's actually saying men and women are the same because actually there's no such thing or reality as biological sex. And it collapses the, the in fact it erases the category of, of women in what I view as an essentially patriarchal act in order to accept the trans agenda. So what liberalism does is introduce a kind of nameless Maoism that, that uh, reduces the distinction that everybody enjoys and which is important to them to a kind of neuter term which doesn't capture anybody or anything. And what I think is interesting in Britain now, which is, I'm proud to say, called Turf Island, um, <laughs> it's one of, of, of the many noble epithets that can be applied to Britain, is, is that we have gay women and lesbians bravely fighting against gender ideology 
and against the pathologies of Stonewall and winning. And they are protecting also our children from the, the education that, that Stonewall wants to enforce upon them and induce all manner of um, evil. Thank God the gender uh, clinic at Tavistock has been closed because what they found was that they were giving uh, puberty blockers that harm children, make them infertile for life, mutilate uh, children. Most often, 90% of them were autistic girls. So you defend marriage not through hate, not through hating other people. You defend marriage through defending difference. And you say there is a particularity that accrues to heterosexuality. And particularity needs to be defended. And there is a particularity that accrues to homosexuality. And there is a particularity that accrues to being a woman. That means you shouldn't have to have men in your bathrooms or in prisons or threatening you in ways that are simply untenable in a civilised society. So the way you defend marriage is you defend difference. And you say liberalism will erase difference and will destroy all distinctions that are important to you. Conservatism will preserve plurality and preserve distinction. So, Senator Santorum, if you'd like to talk about making the case for marriage or the parallels between today and the 1920s. Uh, first off, uh, beautifully articulated, I would add to that that I, I got this question all the time and about gay marriage and, you know, for me to defend traditional marriage. And my response was always, wait a minute, you're the one that wants to change things. Why do I have to, you tell me why this is going to make the country and the world better. Is this going to be better for children? It's going to be better for our society. You need, if you're, you're the one who's doing something that's never been done in 2,000 years of human, 4,000 years of human history, you're the one that wants to completely change the moral ecology of our, of our, of our country. And I have to defend? No, no, you have to defend. And then you, you have to make your case. And now we have the advantage of actually looking, now 10 plus years, and all the things that were promised, have any of them happened? Have, any, ha, have things gotten better for children? Have things gotten better because of the trans revolution for, for children in America today? Now, 21% of, of your generation is LGBTQ, et cetera. Is that, are, are children doing better? Are they healthier? Are they happier? Are they more successful? Are they whatever positive trait you want to, and the answer is no. <laughs> no. It's the most depressed generation in history. It's the most confused generation in history. Why? Do you realize if we want to change the ecology of a swamp, we have to fill out and do years of studies to determine the impact on every creature in the swamp. <laughs> there are literally millions of pages here in Washington filed away. It takes years to just change, to build a bridge over a swamp. Yet we can wreck the entire moral ecology of our society and all we have to say is, oh, it's fair. Or it, I want to be equal. Or you need to respect me. No. No. <laughs> and as for the 1920s, I agree. I think, look, I'm the son of an immigrant. Immigration's a good thing. Legal immigration's a good thing. I'm for legal immigration. And, 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 and I, I believe, look, if we're not having children, we need to have legal immigrants coming to this country, or you can't have 3% growth and 3% uh, GDP growth, which we haven't had recently, but you can't <laughs> generally have two or 3% GDP growth and no increase in population. That doesn't work. So we have to do something I prefer the family track, but 
in the meantime, immigration is, is something that is necessary. Let's take the final two questions. Thank you so much. This has been really, really fascinating. I have a question for Mr. Blonde based on your opening statement. You really stressed two different values, equity and mobility. And I'm wondering if you could reconcile those two for me, because it seems to me that those naturally conflict, that mobility is measured comparatively and therefore conflicts with equity. Let's take the last question and then we'll go back. Um, hi, my name, uh, I'm curious as to if you think that uh, changes in the way that our constitution was initially envisioned as a mixture of governments, that is the uh, uh, democracy in the house, aristocracy or the rule of the few in the Senate and the rule of the one in the presidency being unbalanced both perhaps with you know, the direct election of senators and uh, has actually perhaps accelerated uh, the instability of our society over time. Okay, with those two questions in mind, uh, let me go down the ranks of our panelists and give you a chance to respond to either of those questions uh, or to make any other final remarks that you'd like to uh, put before the audience. So Sam, you go first. Well, <clears throat> I'll address the second question because I've always been interested in that issue of the genius of the American experiment in constitutionalism in bringing together effectively what, effectively what was monarchy, they didn't like the word at the time for obvious reasons, a monarchical function with the aristocratic function with the, the democratic function. And that was designed very much reflecting some of the things that people like Aristotle said about the ideal type of regime, how this should work together. Uh, but I also think about that in the context of some of the things that a person I greatly admire and read all the time, the way he said that so much depends upon the type of culture in which these institutions are operating. And I'm thinking of Alexis de Tocqueville, right? So if you read his Democracy in America, he makes it very clear that even though America had these institutions that were formed in this particular way and developed in this particular way in the Constitution, there was this this, this, this power in the force of democracy itself, this equalizing tendency, which he was very worried about, right? And you can see how that has affected some of the ways in which our constitutional arrangements work. Now, he said that the thing that stopped this from becoming a locomotive that just drove everything into the ground were two things. One was religion, and the second thing he said was the habit of association and associationalism. And that's one thing I think is extremely important because associationalism points to decentralization. Correct. Decentralization. Uh, Philip mentioned the principle of subsidiarity, which is another way of talking about this particular idea. But I happen to think that decentralization, because we, we live in a society in which power has become more and more focused upon the federal government, um, people looking to particular institutions to solve their problems at a federal level, whether it's the, the Supreme Court, whether it's the executive branch, uh, or whether it's the, the Federal Reserve. The more decentralization I think we, we have, I think the better we'll be positioned to try and live out the original constitutional vision that was expressed so well in 1788. So Philip, uh, the first question was asking you about the balance between mobility and stability. And I'd be curious as to um, how you see those values fitting together. It's a very good question, so, so thank you. Um, I wrote an article that, that went to the, was on the front cover of Prospect, which is a British magazine in 2009. It was called Rise of the Red Tories. And, and I said, um, I'm against social mobility. Why? because it's a philosophy of escape and a philosophy of abandonment. I'm not against it for the people who, who, who are empowered, but essentially it's used to justify uh, and to then inveigh against the people who aren't mobile. And the characteristic of working class life is not mobility, it's inertia. The overwhelming majority of people, I mean, you don't get this from reading Cosmopolitan or, or Vogue, the overwhelming majority of people don't, 
aren't that mobile, remain mostly where they are. And because we have failed to attend to them, and because we have a perverse view of meritocracy that say as long as you can escape, what you escape from is just and fair. We use it to persecute those who remain. And so I much fa more favour a notion of equity, not imposed but achieved, than I do uh, a philosophy of mobility. And to um, Sam's point about association, and I profoundly agree, freedom consists, and I've written about this, if we are left, and it's one of my problems with the liberal state, is the liberal state produces absolutism at one extreme and isolated individualism at the other. And there is no philosophy of mediating institutions. In Catholicism and, and Catholic political thought, that's exactly what there is, <laughs> which is a philosophy of mediating institutions. If you create a world in which your theory says all there are are self-interested individuals who signal to each other through price signals and avidly and violently pursue their own self-interest, well, you're going to need a police state if that's your vision of, of society. But if your vision of society is associative and based on freedom, that's a free society because in the end, you can only assert your freedom through a group. And a truly free society is where power is devolved from an absolute estate to that group. And the first group is the family. And that is where power must first reside. And that is the Burkean point, that we must devolve to the particulars we meet and move onwards and upwards with our affection for mankind. And the mark of a free society is not that of isolated individuals pursuing sovereign autonomy, but is that of people working together to advance each other for their common purpose. So I'll invite uh, Senator Santorum to respond to either of the final questions or to share any other last thoughts you'd like to. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll respond to the question about the structure of government and you, you got into a lot more depth than, I was, than, than I'm going to, but, uh, but beautifully done. The, the, the statement was made that the uh, uh, 17th Amendment to the Constitution were the popular election of senators. Uh, uh, you highlighted that appropriately, that fundamentally changed our republic uh, in a way that we have not recovered from. And uh, the, the fundamental change with the popular election of senators uh, removed the principal impediment to a uh, Leviathan state in, in Washington, D.C. It was the interests of the state was always protected because senators were appointed by state legislatures to, uh, to stop the growth. If you go back and look at the federal budget prior to the 17th Amendment, I mean, Washington was a backwater town that nobody paid any attention to. Mm -hmm. The largest source of revenue at the time was the tax on liquor. It's the the reason we got the income tax was because the temperance movement supported the income tax so they could put prohibition in because we couldn't do prohibition because we wouldn't have any money for the federal government because that's how they got most of their money. Uh, so with the 17th Amendment allowing for the popular election of senators, we, unsettled, we, we destroyed the founder's vision of how we could maintain a republic and we have seen all the worst fears of the, uh, the founders of a democracy that was completely uh, beholding to the votes of the people uh, be uh, you know, run a government where people are promised the, the federal purse in exchange for votes. That's what goes on every day in Washington, D.C. And uh, it goes on between both political parties. It went on with me. Uh, it's part, it's, 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 the, it's the coin of the realm and as such, unless we have structural reform to, to change that system, to change the, uh, the way thing is, things are done in Washington, it's not gonna change from 
within. Washington will never be able to fix it. If there's anything I've learned in, uh, in the time that I've been uh, out of Washington and looking back, uh, I've seen the Republican Party become a party that is uh, actually now cheering for more federal control. I mean, just look at the votes recently uh, that we've seen out of, out of the party with respect to, here we are in inflationary times and they're voting for hundreds of billions of dollars more in spending and more debt. They don't care. They don't care. Oh, there's a small group, but not anything that is meaningful. And, and frankly, because of the realignment that we have politically uh, and who led that realignment, which was Donald Trump, he didn't care about the, he, he wanted the central, he wanted more power. Remember, Donald Trump advocated for removing the filibuster. Mm -hmm. Donald Trump wanted to abolish the filibuster and Republicans across the country supported it. Now we thank Joe Manchin and, and Kirsten Sinema for not destroying the filibuster because now we realize how damaging that would be. But Donald Trump wanted to do it. And, and so we, we, we are, conservatives can't be trusted anymore. Uh, and so we need a grassroots movement and, and that's what I've spent the last year of my life actually working on, a grassroots movement to, uh, to get the state legislatures to reassert themselves. And it's, it's one that I don't know whether you're familiar with it, but you need to be, and you need to be involved in it because it's, it's to me, it's the best hope for you uh, to, uh, to have a convention of states under Article 5 of the Constitution uh, where we, uh, the states come together and propose amendments to limit the power of the federal government. Uh, it, was, it was put in the Constitution, it was one of the few, if you read back and look at the founding and look at the Constitutional Convention, there were very few amendments that were proposed that weren't deeply divided the states weren't deeply divided on. This was one that was unanimously uh, adopted, which is to give the states the right, the state legislatures, not the governors, the state legislatures. Remember, they were, they, that's who the, they all came from there. That's who the, the founders trusted to be the voice of the people. The state legislatures to be able to pass resolutions to call for a convention of states to propose amendments. And uh, that's what I've been, to 12 or 13 state capitals this year. I'll probably be to many more next year. Uh, we have 19 states that have proposed, have, have adopted this resolution, and uh, it's called Convention of States. Look it up. And uh, it is, to me, the last best hope, and it's, it's a way to take what is legitimate anger and frustration and cynicism that the public has with what's going on in Washington and channel it in a non-revolutionary way. And I think that's what we need, at least to give a shot uh, for, for you and your posterity. Thank you. So two housekeeping notes before we adjourn. When you do leave, please turn in your name tag to the check-in desk as you depart. Also, uh, please do look at the ISI app and respond to the poll questions there. Those are gonna be very helpful to us in not only evaluating this year's program, but also planning next year's. This is the conclusion of the American Economic Forum, which I hope you have found to be very valuable and most uh, stimulating, and uh, perhaps a nice counterbalance to the so-called World Economic Forum in Davos. Uh, we are try they have Davos men, and we have uh, people, men and women of virtue at uh, the American Economic Forum. And uh, I'd like to thank all of you on behalf of ISI, and I'd like to thank very much our final panel here. Thank you. Woo!